Stanford University. Well, it's great uh, to see so many friends and colleagues. My name is Will Chu. Um, I'm a faculty member in the Material Science and Engineering Department and also in the Door School of Sustainability and uh, part of the Precor Institute uh, for the past 14 years. So you are here to hear about scaling technologies for terawatt hours. And I want to say a couple of things before introducing the speakers. So the format of the session, we have three presentations, deep dives, and then we'll have a short panel discussions to answer your questions. Let me say a few words about scaling. Uh, we have many colleagues from industry. So this is really not what you know, it's about what we're learning. So I think many of these things you already know. But I want to summarize a little bit the shifting mindsets we have at Stanford when it comes to scaling. I want to make five quick points. The first point is that many of the things we are decarbonizing, miles transported, electricity, heat, cement, steel, food, they're all commodities, which means that the most important value that is delivered to the customers and end user is cost. So that's something that we are beginning to realize how important this is, and this was already echoed this morning in some of the plenary talks. The second important aspect is to think about how to finance the learning curve. We heard about these great accomplishments of solar price coming down, EV price coming down, battery price coming down, and so forth. But as we look in the future, as we decarbonize cement, steel, and other hard to decarbonize sectors, how do we go about financing it in terms of markets, government incentives? Um, that's something that we are also thinking deeply about. The third point is a little bit controversial. Um, as someone who works on the technology side, I'm always thinking about disruptions. How do we disrupt with the new technologies and the best technology, but often there's a trade-off between disruption and scalability. I think another key word we should be thinking about is drop-in, whether it's compatibility with infrastructure, compatibility with current markets, to really find that perfect balance between disruption and scalability. The fourth one uh, is something that we've been thinking a lot at Stanford for the past decade, which is what are some of the non-technological solutions to these climate solutions, whether it's decreasing soft costs, whether it's a look at balance of systems, sometimes it's outside of the technology that we're developing. And the final point I want to make here is really to think about how do we achieve resonance between the private investments and the public investment as well. I think we have seen a lot of great success stories, the one I've been really um, excited to tell is the Montreal Protocol for uh, removing CFC as a refrigerant. And there was a very nice set of resonances between policy, technology, and private investment. So those are the quick fight points, the learnings that we have been having at Stanford to think about how to shift our mindsets uh, for both the students and the faculty. Um, and I hope this will also resonate with our colleagues from industry, how things are changing here at Stanford. So for the three talks today, to build up off this theme of scaling, I want to talk, I, I, our speakers will talk about what to innovate. And I think the what here is we need to innovate for scale. Not innovate and then scale, but innovate for scale, and particularly innovate for scale on day one. So you'll hear this theme throughout the talks today. And we will have three talks uh, by my colleagues, Hema Kurundasa from chemistry, Wendy Gu from mechanical engineering, and Karan Burka from energy science and engineering. And let me tell you a little bit about sort of the general themes in each talk to link them together. Um, in Hema's talk, she will discuss how to think about formulation of new chemistry on day one for scalability, whether it's manufacturing, or circularity. In the second talk, Wendy will talk about how to think about manufacturability from the lens of mechanics. How do we make 
devices that's very manufacturable and durable and also safe as well. And then the final talk by Karan, he will address supply chain, market, and also policy intervention. Now, all three talks will focus on different technologies. Hemel will talk about solar, Wendy will talk about next generation batteries, and Karan will talk about the battery supply chain. But please keep these three topics in mind of how do we innovate for scale on day one. And then in the panel discussion, we'll try to bring all these concepts together. So without further ado, let me invite Hema to come up and talk about new generation solar technologies with scalability in mind. That's welcome, Hema. OK, cool. Thank you, Will. Uh, so as Will mentioned, uh, I'm Hema, despite what the long name in the program might say. Uh, and I'm a chemist. So I'd like to tell you today about uh, how we can use chemistry to address the two main problems that'll, that'll impede the, the technological use of a, of a type of solar absorber <coughs> called halide perovskites. So in this slide, I'm showing you a picture of a material that has caused a revolution in photovoltaics. So this is a family of materials that have been known forever. Perovskites you know, you know, go back many centuries. And this material also adopts the same crystal structure that comes to our mind when we hear the word perovskite. So a perovskite is a material that has metals at the centers of this octahedra defined by ligands. So for example, here I'm showing you this material, methyl ammonium lead iodide, where you will see lead at the center of the octahedra, and there are iodides at the vertices, and these octahedra propagate in 3D space by sharing corners to form this turquoise framework. This is your, your standard perovskite framework. Uh, this turquoise framework has a negative charge, so you will find positive ions residing in the cavities defined by this eight corner sharing octahedra. Uh, so here I'm showing you methyl ammonium. Uh, chemists don't show hydrogens in their crystal structures, uh, mostly to confuse people. Uh, but trust me when I say this is methyl ammonium. So as you can see from these references, these materials are not new. They were known a long time ago. But more recently, in 2009, this material was considered as an absorber in a solar cell. So that is the component in your solar cell that absorbs light and generates electrons and holes that will recombine in an external circuit to form current. And it was pretty cool to, to demonstrate a first device efficiency of 4%. Typically, we celebrate you know, percentage uh, efficiencies in the decimal percents when we have a first demonstration. And the great excitement in the PV field is really at how quickly the efficiencies have grown. Uh, I stopped uh, this uh, plot in 2015 uh, because my student graduated. And, <laughs> and also because 20% because is commercially viable. So just to put this in context, any, any other material that has you know, reached commercially viable efficiencies have taken more like 50 years to, to reach those efficiencies. And this little trooper just skyrocketed. So here I have an updated slide made by an, an undergraduate in my lab. And this really shows the sharp increase in efficiencies for perovskites. So that's shown in purple and red compared to other technologies. So there's something very special about this family of materials. And you can see that now, uh, single junction absorber, so that's a solar cell with just one layer of, of the perovskite, is showing really uh, impressive efficiencies of uh, exceeding 26%. And I, I would argue that the real excitement in this field is, is in tandems. So these are solar cells that have two absorbers, a low band gap material like silicon to absorb the low energy photons from the sun, and a higher band gap material, in this case, this would be the perovskite, to absorb the higher energy photons from the sun. And there's so much excitement at the fact that this is now exceeding 30%. So let me tell you what this graph does not tell you, though. It does not tell you what happens to the efficiencies when we actually build a solar cell that's large enough to go on your roof. These are, these are all lab-sized chips, and you can reach these very high efficiencies <coughs> on, a, on a small, you know, small uh, chip. But these efficiencies plummet when you actually consider a, a large-scale module. And this does not tell you anything about stability, which is really the key problem here. These materials are extremely unstable. So the strengths of this material are many, and I could give a different talk on how wonderful they are. But in this talk, 
uh, will ask me to look very critically at these materials and find all of its problems so, so that we can, and I can try to show you how chemistry might, might afford solutions from the bottom up. That means, can we remake this material in a way that where we can completely circumvent some of the problems that are intrinsic uh, to the composition, to the connectivity of, of these structures? So with the warning that I'm going to be very critical and tell you only about the materials problems, I'd like to, for the first part of my talk, I'd just like to go through the problems that we have identified and solutions we have come up with from our group to address them. And at the end of the talk, I thought I'll tell you about an exploratory uh, new type of material we've been thinking about making for the scalable manufacture of perovskites that completely circumvents one of those problems. So to start, we found out early on, and many people who worked with perovskites found out early on that this, black, this beautiful black material turns yellow when it's left on your bench. A yellow material does not absorb sunlight. Uh, it, your material has to be black. And that tells you that any, any mass scale production of perovskites has to be done in a glove box. And this won't fly. Uh, we, we need to be able to produce solar cells out uh, under ambient conditions, uh, and these materials, all the, all the record-breaking solar cells, were made under carefully controlled conditions in a glove box. So we asked the question, how do we engineer moisture resistance into the material as, a, as an in, intrinsic part of the material? So we were very excited to show the first example of a 2D perovskite solar cell. So the idea here is that we can make materials that look like this 3D perovskite has been sliced by this you know, really tiny knife that can cut three layer thick uh, you know, slices of my 3D material. And we can put organic molecules between these layers. And these organic molecules are a lot more hydrophobic than the perovskite. So it's almost like we've, we've taken the 3D material, sliced it very finely, and coated it with a, with a waterproof uh, paint, uh, coating. So these materials turned out to be uh, much more resistant to moisture. And in fact, we could make solar cells out in air. And uh, to date, uh, uh, device engineers are making really high efficiency devices out in air, but using a mixture of 2D and 3D perovskites. So the idea is that if you have a mixture, and you very often do when you spin code these materials, mm -hmm. there are areas which look almost like a 3D perovskite, and that will absorb light and generate current just like a 3D perovskite. But every now and then, you're going to see these layers that are thinner, and these thinner layers are going to come with more organic molecules. And that's going to bolster the moisture resistance of this material. So we were pretty happy that we, we were able to improve the moisture resistance of this material. But we can take a step back and say, well, any, any material that is formed in water surely should go back to water, particularly because when forming the material, we are not forming any, any strong bonds. So what that means is we have to ask the question, what happens to this material when it goes back into water? And, and the lead halide perovskites will almost certainly form lead iodide at some point. And you all know that lead is an extremely uh, toxic substance that we have spent the past few decades removing lead from, from our paints. We can ask the question, are we ready to, to paint our roofs with a water-soluble source of lead? So this is not a deal breaker. We do use water-soluble sources of lead in many of our technologies, including batteries in our car. But we have to keep in mind that this is extremely water soluble. So you can dissolve more than half a gram of lead iodide in one liter of water, meaning that if there is any accidental release of this material into the groundwater, it's very easy to spread. So as the greatest synthetic challenge in this area, my group has spent many years trying to figure out how do we capture the properties of the lead perovskites, but in a composition that does not contain lead. So we don't want a material that looks like the lead perovskite. We want a material that acts like the lead perovskites. Uh, this is a, a tough question, and we have worked with a family of materials called double perovskites, where now you have two alternating metals in the material to try and inch it closer and closer to, to adopting the band structure of the lead perovskites. In the interest of time, I will not be telling you about double perovskites, though it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, if you, uh, you want to chat after this panel, I, I'm happy to tell you as much as you're willing to hear about double perovskites. So that's number two. Number three is a very interesting phenomenon recently uncovered by Julian Verhill in my group, which is that halide perovskites breathe. And you could ask, what does it breathe? It breathes iodine gas. So I use the word breathe 
because in the so we, there are many lessons we can learn from oxide perovskites, where the literature you know is, is very very rich, and oxide perovskites are known to lose oxygen gas at very high temperature, and if you were to expose oxide perovskites to oxygen gas, it I guess it inhales inhales oxygen as well. This phenomenon is, is called breathing, very well known in oxide literature, and it happens at thousand degrees Celsius. So at room temperature, we, know we don't really care. This is, this is very minimal. But the reason that oxide perovskites breathe oxygen at 1,000 degrees Celsius is because they are formed at 1,000 degrees Celsius in a furnace. But halide perovskites are formed at room temperature in water. So guess what? They breathe closer to room temperature. And that means this breathing is now very, very relevant for optoelectronic applications. So Julian did this beautiful study using only single crystals uh, so that he, we, we don't have to take into account any issues with grain boundaries. Uh, he made electronic contact with carbon electrodes. It's a very careful study to make sure that perovskite is not decomposed. He also made contact with silver iodide electrodes to measure ionic conductivity. And I'll just summarize all of this with just this picture here, which is the, the picture that we are developing, which shows the breathing of iodine gas. So at room temperature, the, the iodides in this material leave as iodine molecules. And if you remember your general chemistry, to go from iodide to iodine gas, you have to lose two electrons. So that means every time iodine gas goes out of this material, two electrons dope the material. So you do not want a material whose, whose doping changes over time in any, <coughs> any kind of application. Secondly, if you expose this to iodine gas, it, it absorbs two electrons as well and, and removes and takes up two electrons in the material. So, so that's how the doping changes. So meaning that as the iodine is off gas, the electronic conductivity of this material increases. Now, this can happen only in a closed container. But if your iodine can leave, you might remember Le Chatelier's principle from a general chemistry course you've taken. As the iodine gas continues to grow, continues to leave, you just continue to lose more and more iodine gas. That means you're forming more and more iodide vacancies. So that means it's easier for iodides to hop within your material. You're going to start increasing ionic conductivity. Uh, you're going to start seeing many bad things happen for, with your optoelectronic uh, properties. And if you ask, why does this happen at room temperature? It's because the bonds that you must break are much weaker in the halide perovskites compared to the oxide perovskites. And for both oxide and halide perovskites, the entropy of this reaction is massive because you're going from a solid to a gas. This reaction is spontaneous at room temperature. So what's the solution? Um, the solution is that we must find an encapsulant that in which iodine does not dissolve. And iodine dissolves in pretty much every organic material. If you've ever worked with iodine, it's such a pain to deal with. It, it coats everything, absorbs onto everything. And we have to pay really close attention to the encapsulants we use uh, for, for iodide perovskites because we strongly believe that this entropy and enthalpy arguments we can make to any iodide perovskite, and this is going to be a general reaction. So that means we have to work with our friends in, in maybe polymer chemistry to come up with this encapsulant that's resistant to I2. The third problem we have, we have tried to, to address in these materials is actually one of the, my favorite phenomena in halide perovskites. I think scientifically it's extremely interesting, though technologically uh, it, it's not good. So here I'm showing you a very simple a diagram that shows how the band gap of a halide perovskite changes based on the halide you use. So if you use chloride, you get a big band gap. If you use iodide, you get a small band gap. And bromide gives you an intermediate value. So this is really nice, because if you mix bromide and chloride, you can get these intermediate band gaps. And likewise, if you mix bromide and iodide, you can get the perfect band gap you want for a tandem solar cell with silicon, except that if you make this tandem solar cell, it does not behave like a mixed halide perovskite. It behaves like an all iodide perovskite. So the voltage, no one has been able to get the high voltage they expect to get by mixing iodide and bromide together. And some years ago, along with my colleague Mike McGee, we found out that a very strange thing happens in these materials, which we are studying to date. And I, I would imagine that every 
photovoltaic group working on tandems is, is studying this effect and trying to find a way to fight it, trying to stop it. So this is what happens when you shine light on this material. The halides segregate to bromide-rich and iodide-rich domains. And the bromide-rich domain has the large band gap. The iodide-rich domain has the small band gap. And all electrons and holes that you generate anywhere in this material wants to be here, wants to be in the small band gap material, because that's, how, that's the lowest energy configuration for those carriers. So that means no matter where I generate my electrons and holes, they are going to funnel here and I'm going to get the voltage of an iodide perovskite cell. So we have asked the question, how do we stop this? And the, I, I can talk about all the ways people have chosen to try and stop it, but I want to end, because I don't have that much time, by uh, uh, sort of a crazy idea we've had about how to stop this. So that leads me to the last part of my talk, where we ask the perhaps insane question, what happens, what would happen if we mixed the, the chemical compositions of two known solar absorbers. So you might know that lead sulfide, lead selenide has been considered as a solar absorber. And of course, the, the halide perovskites have been considered as a solar absorber. So is there any way we can put lead sulfide or lead selenide bonds into a lead halide perovskite? And what would be the consequence of that? So if, so if you mix two good things, do you get something better or do you get something worse? So let me start by telling you why this is a dumb idea. Uh, so sulfide perovskites are formed in a furnace at 1,000 degrees. Halide perovskites form in room temperature in water, at room temperature in water. So these are highly incompatible synthetic uh, requirements. Second, sulfide has a 2 minus charge, and halide has a 1 minus charge. And we cannot simply expect a 2 minus ion to adopt the same lattice structure as a 1 minus ion. Anytime you have lead and sulfide in solution, guess what you make? You make lead sulfide. It's a thermodynamic sink. It's very hard to fight this. So we cannot have lead and sulfide in solution if we don't want to make lead sulfide. So GIA decided to address all of these problems by looking not at sulfides, but organosulfides. So that means that's a sulfide where we have stuck an organic group to one end of it. And this changes the charge to 1 minus. So now it has the same charge as a halide. Organosulfides are used by biologists and organic chemists. They go into solution, go into water, and they, they work at room temperature. Except that if you put an organic group to sulfur, you can imagine that it's much bigger than a halide. So how is it going to fit into the halide site in a perovskite structure? So to make space, we took a look at methyl ammonium lead iodide, the crystal structure I showed you previously, and said, well, this is methyl ammonium, that's one plus. This is a halide, that's one minus. So if I considered it together, that's a neutral molecule, right? Plus and minus. So what if I replaced that the A site cavity as well, A site cation as well, with a molecule that has a plus and a minus that brings in the ammonium, so that will replace the methyl ammonium, and brings in S minus to replace the halide. And I'm shocked that this worked. <laughs> so this is, this is what the structure looks like. It's, 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 a, it's definitely a perovskite. It's a pretty distorted perovskite. You can see a lot of tilting between the octahedra. So if you look at your standard halide perovskite, if you look at a chloride and bromide, these are photos of the perovskites. You can see that the chloride is colorless and the bromide is this beautiful red orange. And that reflects the changing band gap, right? As I mentioned, the halide can tune your band gap. So, so if you have a chloride, you have a very large band gap. If you go to a bromide, your band gap redshifts quite a lot. And this is kind of unfortunate because uh, I think it's almost a general rule in materials chemistry that the more interesting your material is, the less stable it is. And, and likewise, the chloride is very stable, but the band gap is way too high. And as you go to the iodide, it, things become more interesting and less stable. But if you look at the consequences of adding sulfur to this material, what you now see is that these band gaps become very similar. It's almost as, as if the perovskite band gap no longer cares whether there's a chloride or a bromide, as long as you stick a sulfur into this framework. And remember, I only replaced one of the halides out of three with sulfur. 
So why is this? Well, here I have a very simple band structure that explains it. In the halide perovskite, the filled states are mostly halide. But in the sulfur per perovskites, even though there are halides in here, and more halides than sulfides, the sulfur states are at the top of this filled states. Meaning that if as long as I have sulfur, I can get a small band gap, even in a chloride perovskite which is really nice news for us because that means we can kind of use the stability of the chloride perovskites and yet have the band gap of the heavier bromide or iodide perovskites. So here's a real band structure if you're, if you're curious. And uh, I won't go through all these details except simply to say that simply by replacing one chloride with sulfur, I have essentially replicated the band structure of the chloride perovskite except that I have moved all the field states up by 0.7 EV, so that's a lot. So we can maintain the highly desirable band structure of the halide perovskites, but just make the band gap smaller by using sulfur. So if all this sounds, you know, this sounds great, right? We, we did exactly what we were trying to do. We put a sulfur into the halide perovskite lattice. We shifted the band gap to exactly where we want to be. So what's the catch? <laughs> the catch? is in the photoluminescence. So we see very clear evidence that there is a trap in this material, a trap state. So the photoluminescence has many of the diagnostics of a trap state. The photoluminescence is, is very weak, broad, and not quite at the bandage. And all of this, uh, including this mobility data, tell us that there is some annoying trap state in this material. But if we could fix this trap state, and there are many, many ways to, to probe the trap states and try to fix it synthetically. These materials could be outstanding solar absorbers, which are much more stable than the halide perovskites. So recently, GIE was able to alloy the selenium into these perovskites as well. And now, excitingly, we can mix the chloride and the bromide. But we can also mix the sulfur and the selenium. And th th this gives us this beautiful range of, of band gaps that straddle the perfect uh, energy range that we are interested in for tandem solar cells. But again, we still see evidence of this trap state, so our work is really well, well cut at this point. We have to identify what is this trap state. Is it a sulfur-rich lead coordination sphere? Is it a halide vacancy? And can we, can we get passivate that trap? So uh, overall, these, these materials that I'm going to call RCH perovskites, uh, have successfully reproduced the band structure that we were trying to, to access. Uh, I didn't show you these data, but these materials are much more stable to heat and moisture, to heat and moisture because we have covalently tethered this molecule to the framework. And we have taken 2D lead NMR studies that show much less ion mobility in these materials. So that means the halide segregation that I, that I told you about previously is greatly suppressed in these materials. So these materials have a lot going for it. Again, they can be made through solution state chemistry, so highly scalable. And uh, we are really focused on trying to figure out what is this trap state, can we quench it, and can we extract photocurrent from these materials? So with that, with that I will end. I have a phenomenal group of students who have been the intellectual leads on this work. I'm thankful for all my funders, and, and thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer questions now or later. Emma, thank you so much. Uh, let's take one quick question. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, I wonder, uh, for the last slide you show, when there is an organosol part, does the, uh, it looks like it distorts uh, the perovskite a little bit, but does that kind of like align each other as well, or it's kind of randomly at the certain connection point? That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's random. So here I'm showing you a one configuration, but if you look at the actual crystal structure, I don't show you the, the organic part at all because it's perfectly randomly uh, situated, so it's perfectly disordered. And, that's and that is why we think we have this large octahedral tilting. So another thing we really want to do is, is reduce the size of that or perhaps make the cavity larger using the inorganic framework to try and reduce that tilting. All right. We'll have, time, we'll have time for more questions later in the panel discussion. Hema, thank you again. You. Um, so now we're going to shift both the technology and the lens. So Wendy Gu from Mechanical Engineering will talk about next generation batteries from the lens of mechanics. 
So shifting from solar cell and chemistry. All right, thank you, Will, for that very nice introduction. And then also, um, I mean, this work is very much done alongside Will and his group. So it's you know, not, not just thinking as a moderator, but as a uh, working together. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about how we're using strain in engineering to deal with some of the uh, critical issues in uh, solid state batteries. Um, this slide, you know, I, I imagine it's not really necessary for most people in the room, but just to get us all on the same page. Um, so uh, electric mobility, electrified mobility and transportation is this huge um, trend in our world. You, we know this, you know, from the news and studies, but also just probably like the number of um, electric vehicles that our neighbors are driving and the, the number of charges that are showing up. Um, and this creates a huge demand for battery technologies to go into these vehicles. Um, and not just things like cars, but you know, trucks are, are now completely feasible. And then um, you know, even things like electric planes, which I think we don't know if is you know, really feasible at this point. Um, OK, and so all of this is driving this uh, huge push for uh, both faster charging. So that's you know, when you go to the charging station with your, your car, you're not waiting for hours, right? You're waiting for 15 minutes to uh, charge up. And then, of course, high capacity. So when you drive to Tahoe for skiing, you know, you can make it all the way um, in your sedan. You, you don't need uh, have any issues there. Um, so this is, a, I, I know this is a very complicated plot, but it's kind of um, showing these different metrics against each other. So here, the takeaway is we want to be in the upper right corner where we both have um, high plating current density and also high cumulative capacity. So this is, you know, uh, combining both the, the fast charging speed and the amount of um, energy that's uh, uh, transmitted. Okay, um, and so right now where we are is lithium ion is, is really ubiquitous. We, we have it all over. Um, and just to, to break it down, you know, these um, devices, there's a uh, graphitic electrode and then usually some kind of um, either a, a, a polymer separator um, and then a metal oxide electrode on the other side um, and then current collectors on either of those. Um, and then I, I really like this image because it just shows graphically what the volumetric change would be. Um, so to go to from lithium ion, where you have the lithium inside of another material, to just lithium metal, you know, now you have the same amount of lithium but in a smaller volume. So if you're trying to pack more you know, batteries into some device, now you can fit a lot more. Um, so some of the you know, the, the pros for doing this are, are safety. So there's no flammable uh, liquids if we go to a full solid uh, system in theory. Um, there could be a higher temperature stability of the solid electrolyte. So this um, separator has been turned into a, a, a solid material that's usually a, a, some kind of ceramic. Um, and then again, we can pack in uh, more volumetric energy density. Uh, and then all of these together will hopefully also lead to higher charging time. So if this is more stable, if we're trying to push current through you know, high voltages um, very quickly, then it will be you know, less likely to uh, break down. OK, so um, uh, like Will says, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, the problems that I think about are in the mechanical space. Of course, there's lots of chemical issues and also just very interesting uh, problems discussion. Um, but the one that um, you know, I'm going to focus on is this problem of lithium dendrite formation. So this is one of the solid electrolytes that's um, heavily studied in the field right now, so um, LLZO. And what we have is that when we start cycling the battery across this material, we have the formation of dendrites. It's, it's like, like how it's drawn here. And what it means is we have this non-uniform um, spread of lithium through the material. So I'm going to try to show this, so this is a, um, from another group that shows this really nicely, but this very fast um, propagation of all these black tendrils, you know, it corresponded to the, the cell over tendril going down, the cell was shorted at the same time. Um, and this is probably the one major challenge um, in this field right now. Yeah, so from a mechanical point of view, um, you know, it's, it's not that surprising, but re reading through all these uh, chemistry papers and battery papers, you know, a lot of the work refer back to an earlier study where um, the researcher described how this soft lithium, there was no way it was going to be able to penetrate the much stiffer ceramics. So, if, you know, you kind of 
put those two ideas together, it's, it's true, it's hard to make a soft material go into a hard material. But from a mechanics point of view, that's um, you know, not true. We know that ceramics are very sensitive to defects um, and can be very brittle you know, when we have small defects on the surface and even if you have small stresses at those locations. Um, so we're, what we're trying to do in the group right now is trying to break down some of the mechanisms behind this and use this as a strategy for figuring out how we can, we can come up with some solutions. Um, so on the right here, this is a, a schematic um, showing the growth of a lithium dendrite and the formation of a stress field in front of it. So this type of argument says that mechanics um, plays the dominant role. Uh, where the pressure that's formed at the tip of the dendrite determines when the material will fracture. Um, an alternative point of view is that uh, there's small spots of higher electronic conductivity through a material, and that leads to plating of lithium metal, and those eventually link up and form this conductive network that shorts the, the cell. And you know, there's been some evidence of both. Um, so again, you know, coming from the mechanics point of view, when we see cracks form, it's very, it's actually, all of mechanics is actually very intuitive. Um, and so if you're having cracks form in this direction, what you do to stop that happening is push it from the other direction, right? So close those cracks. Um, so this is a schematic of the, the battery where you have lithium, the solid electrolyte, and then the cathode. Um, and so what we would need to do is uh, envelop the, the solid electrolyte from the sides to push those cracks closed. So Tung is a postdoc working with me. Um, and so probably, probably this isn't the you know, first time someone thought of this, uh, but he thought of this really clever way to make this happen. Um, so he built this uh, symmetric cell where we have LOZO in the middle. It's sandwiched by lithium. And what he did was use a shape memory ring. So this is a um, uh, device we bought online. It's used for pipe fitting. So what you do is you know, it's, it's like this washer, and then you heat it up. and it, closes, it, it tightens up, and then it's never going to release again unless you bring it to very cold temperatures. Um, anyways, so it applies a, a stress on the, the LLCO. Um, and so you know, the, the application of stress worked, um, and this leads to about 400 megapascals, which is quite high of compressive stress in our material. Uh, this is the uh, control sample before we applied the stress, and it's, it's quite typical in the field. So maybe after 10 or so, you know, maybe possibly up to uh, tens of cycles, the, the cell will break. And then we see the formation of dendrites, these diagonal structures forming across the LLZO. But after we add this biaxial compressive stress, where we have this ring around the LLZO, we see that the... Um, the, the cell lasts you know, much, much longer. So um, in the end, we are able to have greater than five amp hour per centimeter square um, of uh, cumulative capacity. And then this is also, you know, if you turn it into cycles, it's, it's more than 50,000 uh, cycles. So this is 20 days of cycling. It actually hasn't broken at this point. The, the researchers stopped the test. Um, and we're, we're hoping to, we, you know, we're continuing to test to, to push this limit even more. So this certainly seems like a demonstration that, you know, our, our central idea does work in this case. OK, um, looking at things like what else is changing in a material, so we have um, uh, the transport of electrons or ions across the, the solid electrolyte. And at least for the um, electronic connectivity under um, this amount of applied stress, there is a slight elevation of electronic um, conductivity. But that would actually um, give more reason to believe that we would form small lithium pieces that would actually form uh, dendrites across our materials. So it actually you know, is further strengthening our ideas that the mechanical stress is really controlling everything that's going on here. Um, in comparison to other cells, so this is the, the, um, the comparison chart and you know, with other researchers and also the, the goals from DOE. And you know, we're quite happy with our results. We're, we're up here at, at, at 10 um, milliamp centimeter squared of uh, uh, plating current density and also quite high um, cumulative capacity. Um, it is a really busy field. Um, so I, you know, I, I feel like I would be remiss to claim that we're the, the, the best in, you know, in this area right now. You know, recently, there was another study that showed that with this uh, microporous structure, they're able to achieve even higher um, uh, performance. But you know, we're, we're all learning from each other. Um, but some of our differences here are that we don't have um, a very large surface area within our cell. Uh, and uh, you know, hopefully some of our strategies are, are translatable to other battery chemistries as well. 
So in terms of what's happening, you know, that's, that's probably the big question. Um, so in, uh, you know, when we're passing the lithium, it, it still has to go somewhere. And also the mechanical stresses you know, have to do something. Um, so this is a picture of the LLZO after, um, I think this was about 500 cycles of uh, charging, or cycles, and then uh, what we see is this big black mass in the middle, and then even at the sides, we see these tendrils. So if we zoom in, we, what we see is something actually that looks like dendritic structures, so these branch-like structures going to the outer wall. And what happens, um, you know, what we think is happening here is that at each charge this cycle, the lithium is progressively moving in and out, and then some residual lithium is left as they leave this um, optical features. Um, if we now take that sample and look at the side, we break it in half, we see that the cracks that are forming are parallel with the surface. They're no longer going in the harmful direction, you know, from one electrode to the other. Um, and so it looks like cracks are still forming. You know, somehow it would be, you know, against the laws of physics if cracks just weren't forming at all. But they're now going in this direction that's not harmful to the performance. Um, so that's kind of good. We, we can redirect this process. Um, and then looking at where the cracks are forming, we see that cracks are forming both between the LLZO grains. So these are sites that others have seen um, lead to failure, but also through the grain. So it doesn't look like there's a huge difference there. All right, so with that, um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit just for, for the, the, the next few minutes and talk about a related but different strategy for um, also enhancing the performance of um, LLZO and preventing failure. Um, so this is a uh, strategy that comes from you know, the same ideas about mechanical stress um, and uh, the, the material performance, but it borrows a lot from these ideas of ion doping. So this is you know, routinely done, um, both in structural materials, but also the semiconductor industry to change the you know, electronic properties and, and uh, mechanical properties of materials. Um, and what others have seen, including researchers from uh, Berkeley and Brown, um, are that if you implant the surface of a material with ions and create compressive stress, you can have the same type of effect as with Gorilla Glass. That's probably the most, you know, the, 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 the material that everyone in the room knows, right, that the windshield of your, your car um, is processed in such a way that it, when it breaks, it turns into little cubes instead of these big jagged pieces that are very damaging. Um, so this is a simulation, and, you know, since then people have been trying to uh, re reproduce this in experiment, and, you know, we're certainly on that uh, route as well. Um, so this is work that was headed by uh, Shin, who's a postdoc um, from Wills Group, um, who's now a professor at ASU. And what he did was take LLZO and then deposit just a very thin layer of silver, so about three nanometers. Um, and then what he did was heat up the, the silver to different temperatures um, and then measure the properties. So anywhere from room temperature up to 400 degrees. Um, in previous work uh, that our two labs have collaborated on, um, we've used in situ SCM scanning electron microscope imaging to look directly at the failure processes at the micro scale level where um, the most interesting features form. Um, and so what this is is a device where we have our LLZO on top of lithium and then behind that is actually a, a force sensor. And then on top of that we have both a mechanical probe and an electrochemical probe. So through that we form a very localized um, circuit. Um, and when we do this experiment, what we see is that we have lithium plating um, where the probe is attached, and then it's going to be a little subtle. What we have is the formation of these lithium uh, dendrites around this. Um, so it finally happened here. And with this, we can connect the formation of these features to the exact mechanical and electrochemical uh, conditions. Um, here's a colorized version, which is um, much easier to understand. Um, so the, the lithium uh, plated at center, and then these, these intrusions on the outside. So using this, we try to learn about how good our material is, what are the processes that's leading to failure, and how we can prevent them. Um, and so back to the coded sample. So with the silver coded sample, uh, what we generally saw is that for certain of the conditions, um, specifically at, uh, after heating to 300 degrees, we can form much larger uh, lithium plating without the cell being um, short-circuited. Um, and this is shown by a much higher diameter and also a much higher current density. So this is um, this performance. And uh, for comparison, the um, uncoded room temperature sample is down here. So again, this shows that this type of strategy seems to work, at least at the local level, just at the surfaces where the, the probes are attached. Um, you know, we should probably think about deeper how to scale this. 
Um, and of course, the, the question is, why does this work? Um, well, it looks like after a, you know, a great deal of chemical analysis and also working with um, simulation experts, that the silver is entering into the LOZO structure. It looks like what's happening is it's exchanging with the lithium there. Um, and this is able to, you know, we don't have a direct measure of compressive stress at this location, but this seem, it would indicate that there is some um, compressive stress right at that surface layer, and that's preventing the formation of surface cracks that propagate deeper in the material and lead to, you know, uh, failure of the overall structure. Um, we also have evidence of this from nanodentation. So this is a measurement where we take a very sharp probe and push it into the surface and directly measure what force it takes to um, change the, the, the structure of the surface. So what we're looking for generally is these um, Poppins events, these, these sudden changes that show that the tip is going like this and it goes whoop um, into the structure. And if we look at the statistics of how uh, failure occurs, and, and you know, we need to do this statistically because ceramic materials are, are, are brittle and the failure is governed by statistics, um, what we see is that the, the coded sample survives to much higher forces. Okay, so with that, um, I'm gonna uh, wrap up my talk, um, but also you know, bring it back to some of the themes you know, that we're, we're talking about this in session. Um, so what I've shown so far is for a lithium metal battery, so one specific battery system, um, you know, it, it's, I, I think by many it's seen as the, um, you know, the, what's gonna follow lithium ion, but there's certainly lots of challenges, not just the mechanical ones, but in terms of cost, supply, um, chemistry, stability. Um, so another type of battery chemistry that's analogous, that's getting a very hard look right now, is sodium-based uh, batteries. Um, so this could both be for um, sodium ions, so which would have you know, a very similar battery uh, architecture structure as the lithium ion, or even sodium metals. So this would be the same kind of progression of packing even more uh, volumetric energy density in there. Um, and the nice thing about um, you know, the type of strategies we're using and the, the ways we're thinking about this is I think some of these ideas could be extended to the next battery system um, because you know, the, the, the basic principles of how um, stresses govern failure would be the same. Um, here, uh, you know, one of the biggest pushes in the US for this is the fact that uh, sodium is readily available. Um, the largest uh, supply of soda ash is in the US, but that's certainly not true for lithium, which um, you know, I think all forecasts show that it's gonna be depleted at some point, and also it's, it's, it's mostly in, in other countries. Um, lastly, uh, you know, I think the, the uh, influence of mechanics probably can't be understated in all steps of the battery life cycle. Um, so everything from the manufacturing step, so putting together the battery materials using things like hot pressing or code pressing, um, assembling cells, you know, which inherently have some stack pressure, um, thinking about how to formulate that. Of course, during the operation of the battery, which is mostly what I talked about today, um, and preventing failure there. And then finally, even in the last stages, so mechanical grinding to break down the battery components and then reuse them somehow. Um, so if we can bring in these concepts you know, earlier in the research cycle and development cycle, uh, you know, it'll, pr it'll probably be efficient. Um, and lastly, yeah, so, so thanks a lot to the group and, you know, both students and postdoc from my group and Will's group and Will, um, and then funding from uh, Precord has been uh, instrumental in getting this uh, work off the ground. Thank you so much, Wendy. Let's take one quick question. In a real-world application, how do you imagine the stress being applied to the battery? Yeah, that's a great question, um, which I, I also I thought some people probably ask. Um, so that's yeah. So here we're demonstrating that it's on millimeter thick LOZO, uh, but um, the methods I talked about for for doping. Um, for instance, in the coatings or somehow applying surface stresses otherwise are probably more scalable to a, a real device. So, you know, we're, we're showing that applying hundreds of megapascal level of stress, you know, should work. Um, and then the type of uh, processing that's, you know, been used for other glasses or other uh, materials, like semiconductor materials, are probably a, a more scalable way to go. Sure. Chris? Um, can you tell us about the lithium migration? Um, under stress, how does it respond in, in this particular material? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we also did uh, ionic conductivity measurements, and it looks like the it's it's a little it's a tiny bit more conductive, but not too much. I don't think it's a major effect here. All right, what do you think again? 
so for our final talk, um, we have Karan uh, Buaka, who will talk about a systems view perspective that integrates supply chain, engineering, markets, um, to really think about what it would take for new technologies to challenge incumbents. And he will, that's the lens, and then the technology will continue to be batteries. And in this case, and thank you for Wendy, um, to Wendy for setting this up, will be on sodium ion batteries. Thanks, thanks for, oh. Yeah, I think my talk will be a much more zoomed out version of the talk you had. I'm gonna look at scaling. Um, very broadly in terms of how you can model cost reductions over time. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> and I was just filling time till we got that running. Awesome, so uh, I am part of this research program called STEER. It is a partnership between the Slack Battery Center and the Precote Institute for Energy. And the idea behind our sort of research program is guiding what to build by predicting techno-economic viability. And the main sort of the problem we're trying to address is the fact that scale up takes really, really long. So if you look at technologies that we all have either in our pockets or at home, uh, from TVs to mobile phones, they took decades to go from like prototype to commercialization, so multiple decades for that. And then from the first iteration of that product to 10% market share, right? And then they typically follow this S-curve where they scale up really fast, but even though this is fast, it's still a 20-year time before it goes from 10% to 100%, right? So over the whole lifetime, things take between at least 20 to 30 years to up to 40 to 50 years to go from lab scale or pilot scale to full deployment. That's time we don't have, right? If you wanna meet climate goals in 2030, 2050, we don't have the ability to wait for as long as historic timelines have taken for scaling up. So solar PV, again, like had a whole development cycle, lithium ion batteries, um, and EVs with lithium ion batteries aren't even there yet, right? In terms of, if you really, even though they're around us, if you think about how far you need to get to in terms of wide scale deployment, uh, it's not 10% of the fleet. So, the idea behind bringing this group together is thinking about using analysis to guide pathways to speed up that cycle of scaling. So understanding drivers of cost decline, understanding what contributes to cost for these technologies going down, understanding commercialization pathways, so market analysis that looks at what the size of the market is for different technologies, and then also understanding supply chain bottlenecks that typically slow down scaling of technologies. So, this is a group of uh, like formed with Sally Benson, Will Chu, and Adrian Yao, and myself, um, and with support from a bunch of office in the Department of Energy. And essentially, the part to focus on here is I'm going to block the screen for the rest of the part um, is technology learning curves, which is understanding how costs decline over time, um, understanding uh, modeling the supply chain to understand what the sort of lower bounds on cost are, and then using market growth rate analysis and energy systems modeling to understand what the size of the markets for different technologies is. So the idea is we model a technology, and I'm gonna be talking about sodium ion, and understand the costs of the building a sodium ion battery, but then also combine with the supply side to understand the cost of the materials that go in, and the demand side to understand what the size of the market for sodium ion can be. Broadly speaking, the approach, and there's a lot of theory about modeling technology change, is that as scale, and this typically correlates with time, increases, the cost of technologies goes down. You probably have seen a lot of plots like this for solar PV and things like that of, how, of this decline in cost over time. And typically the way you'd model that is you have an initial price, so you know today what the cost of the technology is. You, you have a price floor, which is, in the case of batteries, determined by the minerals prices, so you can't really get much cheaper than the cost of the materials to make the battery. And then you have a learning rate, which is as you get more and more efficient at manufacturing and processes, you get closer to that floor, right? And the, how far you progress down that curve is determined by the size of the market. So as you build more factories, 
you get more and more close to that floor. So in terms of comparing any sets of technologies, you have the current technology, we'll call that lithium ion in the case I will describe, and an which is the incumbent technology, and then there's an emerging technology, which is sodium ion, right? And you want to understand when they, these curves can intersect where sodium ion becomes cheaper than lithium ion. So how can we model that? Right, so kind of this is a math equation, but you take these four components, you have an initial cost, you have the market size, that, and there's this exponential reduction in cost with the bottom floor, which is the minerals prices. So this was work done by Adrian Yao, along with Sally and Will, and the idea is to take those components and model each of those to understand how costs for sodium ion and lithium ion might progress, right? So there were a lot of historic modeling of historic costs for different components was used to understand how those costs have declined over time, so to quantify that learning rate. Um, and that is then combined with estimates of costs of mineral commodities, um, cell design modeling to understand how energy density could progress for these cells, and then demand scenarios to understand how big the size of that market could get, so how quickly could it decline down that cost curve. So kind of putting that all together, you get these forecasted technology curves for different battery chemistries. This is an estimate, and it is bound to be wrong, right? The point of doing this exercise is to understand the relative costs and where you, what are the biggest drivers of those costs, right? So, we have really good historic fitting for NMC of the different components of the cost of the battery. And you can use the technology learning rates and the market growth rate assumption uh, to estimate how that might progress over time. And similarly, you can, we build one for LFP and NNM, which is sodium ion uh, with nickel and manganese. So the idea then is to take that and compare. I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of method so that we get to the kind of highlights, but you can compare the projected cost of LFP versus the projected cost of sodium ion batteries, NNM in this case, um, in a bunch of scenarios. Right, so this is a baseline scenario, and there's a lot of uncertainty based on the inputs that go in, but you could effectively calculate a probability of the sodium ion uh, cell uh, crossing over in terms of cost from the lithium ion cell, right? And in this case, uh, there's a 20% probability that sodium ion is cheaper than lithium ion in 2029, and a 80% probability in 2035, right? So that gives a sense of how long it would take for sodium ion, given these historic technology learning rates, if they could follow those technology learning rates, how long would it take to cross over, right? So the, so the, the idea is then you could say, we could run a bunch of scenarios where we change the inputs, right? So on the vertical axis, you're changing materials prices. So as you go up that axis, lithium is getting more expensive, Graph graphite is getting more expensive, and as you go down that axis, uh, lithium is cheaper. So this is around $10,000 per ton of LCE, lithium carbonate, and that's around $50,000 per ton of LCE, right? And on the horizontal axis, you are increasing energy density of sodium ion cells. So we defined a bunch of technology roadmaps of sodium ion, and effectively energy de density is increasing as you go from left to right. And what this plot shows is you kind of need to be on this top right-hand corner for sodium ion to scale in the next couple of decades, right? Where you uh, it relies both on being able to innovate and increase energy density within the next 10 years, and also it relies on lithium not being super cheap. Because if lithium is really cheap and you can unlock that supply chain, it's unlikely that in the timelines that we're talking about, sodium ion can compete. So it tells you that you need to solve these two problems at the same time. So this is a framework that helps identify where you need to focus our attention in terms of innovation and investment. Right, so from this analysis, some of the key takeaways is Sodium ion is price competitive, uh, but it really relies a lot on lithium ion supply chain disruptions. Um, and so there is a, so you have either strategy of securing the lithium ion supply chain, 
and also, and in the absence of that, it's hard to be competitive. Um, however, like there are some ways out in terms of technology development that can increase energy density, which is one of the ma major reasons why costs are so high. And price volatility can dramatically change the narrative, right? So what tends to happen in the scaling process, what's happened over the last couple of years, is you have this huge spike in lithium prices, and then the costs go up, and then you're like you're looking for alternatives. And if uh, if you think of how those curves are coming down, there's a bump in the lithium curve because the price of the materials went up. And at that point in time, sodium ion gets cheaper and takes up more of the market, and that progresses further down the curve. Right? So these volatilities in the market and supply chain really matter in terms of which technologies get cheaper faster and go further down that learning uh, scale. So realizing that this is a model and it has a lot of assumptions in it and it's bound to be wrong, what we did is we said, this is what we worked on, and we've got a bunch of companies in the sodium ion space who are building these batteries and the lithium ion space to come into a room and effectively tell us why we're wrong. Right? So this provides a framework where companies can say, we think your technology learning assumption is really slow because this is what we can do to speed that up. Uh, we think the manufacturing cost assumption is pretty high right? because we can use drop-in manufacturing, and we can use the same facilities that already exist for lithium ion, for sodium ion. So what this allows people to do is you have this tool that estimates costs in various scenarios, and people can then say, if we could speed this up, or if we could secure our supply, I'm a company that can get material for much cheaper, if I can secure that, where does that put me on that cost curve? And that's the idea of sort of building this approach, which allows people developing technology to come together and discuss what needs to be done and where, uh, where focus needs to be put in terms of scaling up these technologies. So we focused uh, in the, over the last few months on sodium ion. Going forward, we're trying to move on both upstream and downstream. So uh, a lot of the focus will be looking at graphite and carbon supply chain. So what's the cost of synthetic graphite production and building cost models to understand how those costs can be reduced and then uh, on the demand side, using energy systems modeling to estimate uh, what is the value of deploying these technologies on the ground. So one thing we learned from the forum is that dollars per kilowatt hour is not a good metric to estimate the competitiveness of sodium ion or lithium ion. It's a good metric, but it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient, right? So you need to be able to quantify value in other ways, like in terms of safety, in terms of, uh, like, a power throughput, things like that, right? And then, so that's why we're trying to do more modeling to understand the value of these technologies beyond just dollars per kilowatt hour. So that's the other effort on the demand side. So I'm going to stop there, and I think we have enough time for a panel, but I can take any questions right now as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. That's it. One quick question before we go to the panel one is, are you looking at other technologies besides sodium ion? Because there's so many ESS technologies that are being looked at. Vanadium redox flows and other technologies also that are probably further along the commercialization pathway. Yeah. And the second is, uh, this assumes that you're using sodium ion looks like for mobility, but for stationary energy storage, the energy, your uh, assumption of uh, energy density really is not applicable to stationary energy storage. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll go in reverse. The second question, we're modeling cell level costs in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour. It's not, oh, I think one of the next things you're going to do is uh, you know, model the cost of making the system. So this doesn't, it doesn't say whether it's applied in EV or in ESS. Right? But you're right that this, at a system level, it might not matter that energy density is so low, and you could still have a cheaper system for energy storage if you use sodium ion. Um, and we're looking into that. The second one, we, the, the dream of sort of this modeling is to be able to evaluate a large set of technologies and be able to compare them. I think we rely on sort of feedback in forums like this on uh, our partners in the DOE to figure out which ones we should select. Because I think that's the biggest challenge we face is which other technologies we pick to compare. Because to do each takes a lot of time. Um, so that slows down the scaling process. Uh, if, if we are the ones who are slowing it down by deciding which ones to pick. But yeah, I think um, it's a, that, that's probably, to me, the hardest problem 
is figuring out which technologies to select to model. Um, and that's why we rely on sort of the people doing the work to tell us which those are. All right, maybe let's move into the panel discussion. And I I'm sure Karan and Wendy and Hema will be available to chat more during the break. So let's uh, grab a seat up here. Go ahead, Karan. Sure, sounds good. So um, I thought I would just begin with the maybe two questions to tie things together across the three talks. So my first question is for Hema and for Wendy. So both of you, and me, uh, we are working very much at the laboratory scale. I think both Wendy and Hema mentioned that. In, in your mind, how, what are the approaches you're taking or what are your mindsets in ensuring that these laboratory scale learnings can survive as you scale up and as the technology transfer out of Stanford? I think my biggest fear is always, I learned something great, but it just applies at a lab scale. How do I make sure that as we go you know, 10 orders of magnitude up, that these knowledge continues to apply? Maybe Hema can start. So, so my job, I just said as a chemist, I don't have to worry about devices. Uh, but, <laughs> but my job is to make sure that whatever composition I give can be reproducibly, scalably made. And there, the materials I work with have a huge advantage because we make everything from solution. So we just take a solvent and we throw all the precursors into a pot. The solution is completely homogeneous and then we just pin coat it. So that, we, we are lucky that scalability there is, is quite straightforward. And I, you know, as, as you know now, there are many problems with halide perovskites, but scalability of forming you know, larger and larger films is not so much an issue for maintaining the composition. But you're right, Will, that what we, what we really need to control are the defects, the doping. So it turns out that if I make a halide perovskite in my lab and my friend at the University of Washington makes, a, makes the same composition in his lab, we will have different doping levels, different defects. So now we care a lot more about like, what's, the at, what's the atmosphere, what's the humidity. Uh, in, you know, in what order did we do the steps? And then we will intentionally measure the doping. We will go looking for the defects because we eventually need to give a recipe to, for industry which takes into account everything, not just the composition and not just the structure, but all those things we do not see in the crystal structure, the things we do not see in the band structure, which ultimately can dictate you know, the entire properties of the material. So we even now care about the partial pressure of iodine over our materials because now we know that it really matters. So we have homemade chambers for iodine partial pressure and many of our hoods look purple now. Uh, because yeah, we, are, we are really playing around with iodine. So I think the two learnings are chemistry insights at the molecular level is really scale independent. So you can take it up, and that same scientific understanding uh, propagates the scale well. And I think the second learning is sort of figure out what we don't control and what we don't know, so then make sure that as we transfer across scale or even just try to reproduce the results, then we can get much better um, reproducibility across the board. I think that's right. I think in the literature you will find a lot of papers talking about how halide perovskites are defect resistant. We know that this is no longer true. There are defects. They are not deep defects, so that's a good thing. But there are defects and we have to be mindful of what they are and how they will electronically influence the material. Wonderful. Wendy, how about on the mechanic side? Are they also skill independent or are they skill dependent? Yeah, so yeah, great question to lead with. Um, yeah, so I think w when we start our projects, we always try to look ahead to the manufacturing side. So, you know, like um, Will already said, you know, we're really at the, the lab scale and doing fundamental science there. But we make sure that we're not, um, you know, in incompatible with the, the, the following steps. Um, so I talked about some strategies for introducing stress into materials. Another one I didn't talk about, for instance, is uh, laser shot peening in structural alloys. And so this is, you know, it's not pretty sophisticated, but if you, you know, run lasers across huge areas of structural alloys, right, then the surface will, will change and get the compressive stresses you want. So this is the kind of thing where it indicates, you know, we might not be able to use the same technique for battery materials. There's all sorts of chemical, you know, sensitivities there. Um, but it means that there's, it's not, uh, you know, fundamentally limited to doing this on very small areas. Others have already done this on very large areas, you know, very high throughput. Thank you, Wendy. I think, yeah, this is something that we are very passionate about at Stanford is, is really to make sure that, although we work at very small scales, 
but the insights, especially the scientific insights, can then propagate very easily. I think this is really the underpinning of what I would call mechanistic insights. Um, they are often very scale independent. Um, Karan, so you talked a lot about supply chain, minerals, and I think one thing you didn't say is that your background is in analyzing the minerals supply chain. And I thought maybe I will try to sort of connect the dots between the three of you. You know, the mineral industry, the mining industry, uh, is one of the most skilled up industry. Um, and it is a slow industry, it takes 10 plus years to permit a mine. And as such, uh, innovation is slow to come. Uh, I'm curious for your thoughts and also for Wendy and Hema's thought on sort of what roles do chemistry and material science have to play for mining? So Karan, give us a sense of you know, what are the big opportunities and can we use these innovations to bring the innovation timeline down for mining? I, I know many in the room are looking at new ways of extracting uh, resources like lithium that requires new technologies, much more going at Stanford as well. Um, Karan, give us a sense of what are some of the opportunities uh, on the chemistry and the material side. Yeah, I think typically, like most currently set up mining projects rely on really old, dirty processes. And I'll, let me just, as a side note, present what the opportunity is, why innovation is particularly useful in the mining industry, which is what slows down supply chain growth is the largest risk to opening a project is the fact that there are huge ESG implications with most mining processes. So there's large amounts of land displacement, waste management, and tailings management is hard. A pyrometallurgic process release a lot of um, like sulfur dioxide, things like that, right? So there is processes that can reduce energy intensity, processes that can do leaching with less damaging waste streams are chemical processes that can not only you know, make mining better and cleaner and faster, and it also ensures that these projects actually get built because communities are more likely to permit them. So maybe that's a, I think there's an opportunity to work on, I, largest opportunity I think is in terms of waste management, which is a huge, uh, where you have a lot of effluents that come out of leaching projects that have a lot of chemicals that you need to recover to make sure these effluents are safe. Um, yeah. Effluents chem sounds like chemistry. <laughs> Emma. Everything is chemistry. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so I guess my, my dream is to replace lead with bismuth. In these halide perovskites, bismuth is isoelectronic with lead. And if I, I, haven't, I don't often think about mining. <laughs> But I do know that many of these minerals come in the oxide forms. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we will have to break metal oxygen bonds and form these metal halide bonds. So we have been developing some chemistry along those lines. So what's the driving force to, to rip out oxygen and replace a metal oxide bond with a, with a metal iodide bond? Well, the driving force has to be a more stable metal oxygen compound. And sand is everywhere. Sand is silicon ox oxygen bonds. So we are developing some chemistries that, that rip out that oxygen to form silicon oxygen bonds and give us the metal halide. I don't know about scaling at the levels of, of, of mining, but I, I imagine similar chemistry will have to be developed to get the most, the most common form of the metal and then convert it to the, to the ion that you want. We I have, um, yeah. just if I could prod you a little bit on that one. Yeah. one of the in terms of nickel, one of the toughest parts of nickel processing is effectively taking nickel oxides and making it a nickel sulfur mat, right? So taking the oxygen away and putting sulfur in, and then yeah. because that process is not 100% efficient, a bunch of that sulfur goes out as SO2, right? So are there things that, you know, about how you could sort of strip out the oxygen, put in sulfur that yes. Yeah, so, so, the, so the common synthetic trick is to, to liberate H2S, which is uh, highly toxic. But it's actually, it can, it's manageable. I, I, I do, again, I don't know whether it's reasonable in the industrial scale, mm. but if you protonate the oxygen, you basically lose water, or, you can, or if you protonate the sulfur, you lose H2S, and it's a gas, right? Mm. So, so you drive the reaction forward. Wendy? 
Okay, yeah, so yeah, really interesting question. So for from the battery side and, and maybe specifically sodium batteries, um, you know, when I was delving into literature, I, I was really interested to see the name Trona kept coming up. And this is actually a small city in Southern California where I happen to have a friend and I, I've actually been there many times. Anyways, but it's a huge, um, uh, it's, there's a mining uh, operation, the Searles Mining, Valley Mining Company, um, and it's this huge source of, of soda ash. And so there, one of the huge benefits is that it's already in the form of sodium carbonate. There's not too much more additional work that needs to be done to get it in a form that's useful for the battery industry. So looking you know, at that point, looking at like a d domestic site, you know, looking for something that um, doesn't take that much more work to get there. Um, and also like for our community where it is now, it means not being locked into one battery chemistry, so not being locked into lithium ion so that there's enough freedom to look at these other chemistries and um, you know, have motivation to uh, start from the very first mining steps from, from these other areas. Um, another really interesting uh, direction that, for instance, like the DOE is really pushing is kind of co-mining. So for instance, uh, Syria is, there's been a huge push to use these in structural alloys. I don't know that there's a huge reason to do that for itself, but because it is a rare earth metal that can be mined along with other rare earth metals. So if people can find a, um, you know, cost, uh, you know, a, a good product for Syria that would make the other additional uh, minerals more cost effective to mine. This is very fascinating. So, um, so my department of material science and engineering has its roots in um, metallurgy and also mining as well. So we're going back and you know, rethinking about what we can do differently. Let's take a couple of questions uh, for our panelists. I, I don't, we, we don't have too much time, but um, yep, and then Amy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leo. I'm a visiting PhD with Ines Acevedo. Uh, I have a quick question for you, Wendy. Uh, you said that you're studying um, ceramic um, yes, separators for solid state batteries. And I'm wondering, there's also the, the composite, uh, uh, sorry, a composite uh, electrolyte, or, yeah. And I'm wondering, because the ceramic is the brittle part in it, um, for when it comes to the dendrite formation, uh, does the composite electrolyte perform better? And if so, so a composite being like both polymer and ceramic. Uh, and if, if yes, I mean, would that alleviate the need to apply pressure from a radial direction? Yeah, that's a, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not com super familiar with that area, um, but some of the issues with the polymer materials in general is, is lower stability um, than the ceramics. Um, one thing that we are starting to explore, both uh, Will and I together, is uh, sulfide uh, materials. So they're, they're not the same crystalline oxide ceramics, but certainly trying to get different types of um, mechanical properties, you know, where we don't start with the same type of problems that we do with oxides. Amy? So I, I was thinking about all the different approaches that you have been talking about as, as far as scaling up, and what's the... There's a bag of tricks on how to potentially scale things up. You guys have mentioned, you know, encapsulation, um, the mechanical approach to try and reduce cracking. Um, when, one thing that I probably didn't come up in your um, the steer work yet because of the nature of what you're looking at, but also like modular number up versus volumetric scale up, and so. Some of those are probably pretty well known, but I'm just thinking about guidance for kind of folks looking at early research technology. Is there something maybe through the steer work where you can look and see what are, what is that bag of broad bag of tricks for people to think about um, that could be shared and kind of, you know, for people thinking about new technology to then kind of, you know, have those in mind as they think about some new idea. Because one thing I think, which is fantastic to think about scale from the beginning, there's probably technologies, I've been trying to think of some, but what we have today that's pretty robust, that back then at the time people might have said, that will never scale, <laughs> right? Because maybe they didn't think about the broad bag of tricks on how to scale. So just a thought um, for future as we look broadly um, to think about scale from the beginning think about that bag of tricks, because it's not always obvious what will scale and what will not. I mean, that's a great comment. I think we should not only, as academics, understand the bags of tricks, but we also need to maybe make some new bags as well, uh, innovate on those. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I thought I would ask each one of our panelists to just briefly comment on the following question, which is, you know, hearing all throughout the 
conference today, the importance to scale, and I think we all share a passion to ensure that the work we do at the university translates to solutions at some point down the road. What will you do differently going forward to ensure this impact at scale uh, that you're not doing today? What are some of the new ideas or new approaches you think that we and our colleagues ought to take? Maybe I can ask Emma again to start. Oh, well. <laughs> Um, so, so one thing I've been thinking about is, uh, given the vital Im importance of the encapsulation, we've always thought of the encapsulant as something different, where we would make the perovskite, someone else will come along and slap on the encapsulant. But now that I realize how very important it is, and I've talked to people who told me there's no such thing as a pinhole-free coating on your roof. <laughs> there will be pinholes. Uh, I realized that these are not two separate things, that I have to make my film with the encapsulant. So maybe I can attach the encapsulant to my film, and I can make sure that that is periodic, maybe lattice matched with my perovskite. So now, even though I said it's great to be a chemist and I can just make my materials and give you the recipe well, uh, now I feel like that's not true anymore, that I, I now have to make my film and maybe make the lattice matched encapsulant and ensure that what I give you is protected. So you have to go to devices now. It's too bad, yes. So that's a different... <laughs> <laughs> so I have to get off my high horse. Yeah. <laughs> Wendy? Oh, yeah. Um, I, think I'll, I think we didn't actually answer Amy's question. Just really quickly, maybe like a little bit of advertising. I think I, I actually only have one bag of tricks, but across Stanford, um, you know, there's multiple. So I think looking at the, the range is probably like a huge benefit of uh, Stanford. And then, you know, what I would do differently or, or going forward. Um, so it's not that I don't want to work with scaled up processes. I don't have the infrastructure for it. So if we had access to pilot scale facilities, which um, I think Will is really trying to uh, build at Slack, so a national lab, um, you know, that would really open the doors to exploring different ways. So, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to the, the battery space. But, but having, so National Lab is probably the right space for it. You know, we really can't have that at a, in university, it's just not the right environment, um, but it's also not a company. Great point. I'll pass my hat around shortly. <laughs> Karan, final words. Yeah. I think one thing I would do differently is we, like in terms of modeling technology innovation, we like think everything is new and has to be done differently. But to your bag of tricks point, I don't think there's enough understanding of the innovations that have, have happened in the past, what have driven those. So in minerals processing, when you have changes in how minerals are processed, what were the contributors where one technology took over from the other? We kind of ignore history a little bit and try to look fresh. I think what I would do differently is kind of go back more and see what drove these different innovations to learn what can be used from that in the future. Innovate by starting to look backward. Yeah. Great. <laughs> well, what would be the mistakes of the past, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think learning from learn it. From, yeah, learn, learn that. Well, we are at negative two minutes. Um, please join me in thanking our panel. And thank you, everyone, for coming.